Hey everybody, I'm Joshua Oro of the Mustang Prince, and welcome to Mustang Prince Oro Reports. So, after blogging the Magician's Elephant last episode, now would be a good time to take you back to an elephant movie that I blogged back in early 2019, which would have to be Tim Burton's Dumbo. Now, like I said a while ago, I understand that the live-action Disney remix have been getting a mixed reputation nowadays, kind of like the straight-to-video Disney sequels did. But, to be honest, I actually don't mind them due to the nostalgia that they share and several new touches that they include. However, to be quite honest, my least favorite out of these remakes would have to be 1996's 101 Dalmatians, which I'm saving for a future blog, and my absolute all-time favorite would have to be 2016's The Jungle Book. Plus, I really loved what Tim Burton did with the famous flying elephant by taking the original story and expanding it a bit. However, for a couple years now, ever since I blogged this film, I've been thinking that I should give a full blog on the original animated classic and see how it holds up today despite the fact that I was originally hoping to make this a Mother's Day blog. <sighs> if only so many things didn't get piled up on my plate over the last few days. But anyway, let's get started. Released on October 23rd, 1941, the movie is Dumbo. Now, on for the plot of the movie. The film centers on a baby elephant who is born with comically large ears and is given the cruel nickname Dumbo. One day at a show, he is taunted by a group of rowdy kids, inciting his mother into rage that gets her unfortunately locked up in a clink. After Dumbo's ears cause an accident that injures many of the other elephants, he is made to dress like a clown and perform dangerous stunts. Thankfully, Everything changes when Dumbo discovers that his enormous ears actually allow him to fly, and he astounds everybody at the circus with his new talents. So, what do I think? Well, believe it or not, this was one of my favorite animated Disney films ever since I was little, and I still love it to this very day. And to further explain why I love this movie, Let's head over to Mustang Notes. Now, in case I didn't mention it four years ago, the movie is based upon a book written by Helen Aberson and Harold Pearl for the prototype of a novelty toy, Rolla Book. The book was first brought to the attention of Walt Disney in 1939 by Kay Kamen, the studio's head of merchandise licensing, who showed a prototype of the Rolla Book that included Dumbo. Disney immediately grasped its possibilities and heartwarming story and purchased the rights to it. Originally, the film was intended to be a short film. However, Disney soon found that the only way to do justice to the book was to make it a feature-length film. At the time, the foreign markets in Europe had been curtailed due to World War II, which caused Pinocchio and Fantasia to sadly fail at the box office. With the film's modest budget, Dumbo was intended to be a low-budget feature designed to bring revenue to the studio. Story artists Dick Humor and Joe Grant were assigned to develop script outlines in chapters, much like a book, an unusual way of writing a film script. They conceived the stork delivery and the pink elephant sequences and they had Dumbo's mother renamed from Mother Ella to Mrs. Jumbo. They riffed on elephants' fear of mice by replacing a wise robin named Red found in the original story with a wise-cracking mouse character named Timothy. They also added a rusty black crow, which was later expanded into five crows. Regardless of this, very little was changed from the original draft. In March 1940, the story team, headed by Otto Englander, translated the outline into story sketches. Sadly, 
Production on Dumbo was interrupted on May 29th, 1941, when much of the Disney animation staff went on strike, which I've already mentioned during my Salute as Amigos blog. However, Ward Kimball chose to not to strike, but his close friend Walt Kelly, who was an assistant animator helping him on the Crow sequence, left the studio shortly after for reasons unrelated to the strike. Fun fact. Some folks have interpreted the clown's request to get a raise from their boss being a reference to the Disney animators that went on strike, demanding higher pay from Walt himself. However, Art Babit, the animator and organizer behind the strike, denied this claiming, stating that he had been assigned to animate the sequence before the strike. From Disney's perspective, Dumbo required none of the special effects that had slowed down production and grew the budgets of Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Bambi. When the film went into production in early 1941, supervising director Ben Sharpstein was given orders to keep the film simple and inexpensive. As a result, the character designs are simpler, the background paintings are less detailed, and a number of handheld cells, or frames, were used in the character animation. Although the film is more cartoony than previous Disney films, the animators brought elephants and other animals into the studio to study their movements. Plus, watercolor paint was used to render the backgrounds. Dumbo is one of the few Disney features to use the technique, which was also used for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and regularly employed for the various Disney cartoon shorts. The other Disney features use oil paint and gouache. Fun fact, 2002's Lilo and Stitch, which drew inspiration from Dumbo, also made use of watercolor backgrounds. Now, from my perspective, ever since I was little, not only do I think this style of hand-drawn animation is classical, like the other animated Disney films from the Golden Era, but I think the use of watercolor is nicely handled and the idea of Disney bringing live elephants and other animals into the studio made me think of what they did for The Lion King years later. Plus, since this film mainly takes place at a circus, I think some parts of the animation are pretty zany and some of my favorite scenes in the movie is the part where a flock of storks deliver several baby animals to the circus, and later when Mr. Stork delivers baby Dumbo to Mrs. Jumbo while on board Casey Jr. Oh, and by the way, on the topic of Mr. Stork, Dumbo is not the only movie that he was featured in. I also like the part where the railroad workers and the circus animals help set up the circus tent, the adorable bat scene, the part where Dumbo flies with a little help from a magic feather and the scene at the end where he flies without it. However, nowadays, I still do not like the scenes where Dumbo gets teased, especially by an antagonizing human bully. Jeez. Why must people be so cruel, especially to someone so unique and special? Anyway, after this movie was released, not only did it influence a couple rides at the Disney parks, but it also influenced a live-action children's TV show called Dumbo Circus, which I used to watch when I started watching the Disney Channel during the mid-90s. And of course, Dumbo became a summonable ally in the Kingdom Hearts game series. Also, there was going to be a direct-to-DVD sequel during the 2000s, but it was sadly canceled when John Lasseter became chief creative officer of Walt Disney Animation Studios in 2006. And now let's talk a little bit about the film's musical numbers. And since I kind of mentioned the Mr. Stork song, the Clown song, and the Rust About song, let's start with a song about the famous little engine who could, Casey Jr. Now this song plays when Casey is chugging his way throughout the U.S. towards the next circus destination. To me, I find this to be one of the catchiest songs in the entire movie, and 
I really love when Casey does his funny little whistle sound and when he chants, I think I can, while climbing up a big hill. Plus, I also like that this song is featured on his ride at Disneyland. Next we come to Baby Mine, which is performed by Betty Noyes while Dumbo is visiting his mother who is sadly locked up in solitary confinement. To me, this song is one of the most emotional and tear-jerking songs in the history of Disney. And I think it makes a very sweet lullaby song. And it's the kind of song that you'd listen to when Mother's Day rolls by. Plus, I really love when Mrs. Jumbo gives her baby son a swing on her trunk. And the part where we see several circus animals sleeping with their children is just so darn sweet and adorable. Also to note, not only was this song nominated for an Academy Award, but it's been also sung by several singers over the years, like Eden Espinosa, Alison Krauss, Bette Midler, even the late Michelle Nicastro. And now we come to Pink Elephants on Parade. This song centers the imaginary yet nightmarish pink elephant's hallucinations seen by Dumbo and Timothy when they mistakenly drink the clown's alcohol, which was accidentally dumped into a bucket of water. To me, this sequence is very random, trippy, and eccentric. But at the same time, I find it pretty creative that the elephants can take on different shapes and colors, and I can sort of tell that the animators were having a lot of fun with it. Plus, I think the ballet part is pretty sweet at best, while the ending part is really berserk due to things going really fast and out of control and then exploding. Plus, I'm kind of not surprised that these pink elephants made an appearance in one episode of the House of Mouse TV series. Also to note, while I still think the version from the 2019 live action film was handled better due to it being a bubble show, I consider Phantasmic's version my favorite due to the rock and roll and jazzy rhythm. The last song to talk about is When I See an Elephant Fly, which is sung by the crows while making fun of Timothy's idea of a flying elephant. Now, to me, while it is a bit mean-spirited, this would have to be my all-time favorite song in the entire movie. And I think some of the lyrics are pretty genius due to them referencing phrases with double meanings, like a peanut stand, a fireside chat, a baseball bat, a rubber band, etc. Also, I like that it gets followed by a couple of reprises, like during the scene when Dumbo flies for the first time, and at the end of the movie when Dumbo becomes a circus star while reuniting with his mother. And now, let's move on to the characters and a few of their voice actors. Let's start with the film's main star, Dumbo. Now, ever since I was little, I thought Dumbo was the most adorable elephant calf ever mainly due to his cute little face and blue eyes. And while he doesn't have any speaking dialogue, I really love his childlike and fun-loving personality. And every time he feels alone, humiliated, or mistreated, it really makes me feel really bad for the poor little fella. Plus, I think Dumbo's ears are really, really special. And while they were the reason why he was ridiculed, they were also what made him famous, due to them giving him the ability to fly. Also to note, Dumbo is one of several characters who I'd love to be friends with since, well, we outcasts have to stick together. Plus, you may remember a while ago that I did compare Dumbo to characters like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Happy the Baby New Year, and Princess Flurryheart. Next is his mother, Mrs. Jumbo, voiced briefly by Verna Felton, whom was Fairy Godmother in Cinderella, the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland, Aunt Sarah in Lady and the Tramp, 
Flora in Sleeping Beauty and Winifred in The Jungle Book. To me, like most Disney mothers, Mrs. Jumbo is a very loving character, but also very protective. However, when Dumbo was being teased by a group of rowdy boys, I thought her protectiveness went way out of hand, and it made the circus employees think that she's gone mad, and she sadly got locked up in solitary confinement as punishment. But thankfully, at the end of the movie, after Dumbo becomes a circus star, not only is Mrs. Jumbo released, but she and Dumbo receive a private train car. Plus, I really love the part where she used Dumbo's ears to wrap him up like a blanket. Next we come to Timothy Q. Mouse, voiced by Edward Brophy, who's best remembered as the sidekick to the Falcon in the Tom Conway film series of the 1940s. After Mrs. Jumbo got locked up, Timothy becomes Dumbo's closest friend and guardian, and he does his best to make Dumbo happy and to help him become a circus star. In my opinion, Timothy is a really fearless character, and he kind of reminds me of Jiminy Cricket, in a way. Also, I think his Brooklyn accent is pretty cool. Also, my favorite scenes involving Timothy is when he scares the other circus elephants while standing up for Dumbo, and the part where he poses as the ringmaster's subconscious and tricks him into making Dumbo his climax. Plus, I like that Dumbo holds onto Timothy's tail like a child holding an adult's arm, and I like that at the end of the movie, Timothy becomes Dumbo's manager and he signs a Hollywood contract for him. Moving on, we come to the circus elephants, which consist of the matriarch, also voiced by Ferna Felton, Katie, voiced by Noreen Gamil, Prissy, voiced by Sarah Selby, and Giddy, voiced by Dorothy Scott. The matriarch is the one who holds her social status due to being bigger, stronger, and she's also business-minded, and she expects all members of the circus to give nothing but the best and add something to the show. Katie is bold, cheeky, and kind of bossy, and she particularly loves gossiping and drama. Prissy is the one who speaks with a high-pitched voice and is never short on opinions, and Giddy is the one who's very talkative, cheerful, and loud. In my opinion, these elephants kind of have some ups and downs throughout the movie. The ups being the part where they helped guide Mr. Storm to their train car, they participated in the Elephant Pyramid Act, and they were, at first, pretty sweet to little Dumbo until his large ears were revealed. However, I didn't like the scenes where they give Dumbo the cold shoulder, as well as calling him a freak and blaming him for his mother being locked up. But thankfully, they do get their comeuppance when Dumbo shoots peanuts at them with his trunk. Next is the circus ringmaster, voiced by Herman Bing, who sadly committed suicide by gunshot in 1947. Now, while he's not technically the antagonist, I find him to be a very strict greedy and arrogant man whose main objective is to put on a decent and entertaining show for profit and he exploits his workers and animals. Finally, we come to the Crows, which consist of dandy Jim Crow, voiced by Cliff Edwards, who previously voiced Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio, Fats Crow, voiced by Uncle Remus slash Br'er Fox himself, James Basket. Deacon Crow, voiced by Francis Hall Johnson of the Hall Johnson Choir. Specs Crow, voiced by Nick Stewart, a.k.a. Br'er Bear. And Dopey Crow, voiced by James Dundas Carmichael, whose photo I can't seem to find. Anyway... I understand the reason why these guys are the most controversial characters in the entire movie. However, in my personal opinion, 
These bird brains are real wisecrackers who pride themselves in having seen everything. Though they, at first, taunt and mock Dumbo, after Timothy tells them off and shares Dumbo's background with them, the crows become so ashamed of their behavior that they later redeem themselves by teaching Dumbo how to fly with a magic feather from Speck's tail. And now on to my final words. Overall, Walt Disney's Dumbo from 1941 is a classic animated film from the golden age of Disney. And as much as I adore Tim Burton's 2019 take, I still consider this film as one of my childhood favorites. The animation is timeless and zany. The main character Dumbo is very relatable and just so darn cute that I really want to give him a really big hug. And like I said before, we outcasts must stick together. And I think Timothy Q. Mouse makes a great father figure and mentor character. Plus, despite some mean-spirited moments, I think the story is very heartwarming. And the songs are very classical and catchy. Even though one was really trippy, weird, and eccentric. And believe me when I say... That if I ever had kids in my future, I would definitely share this movie with them. As for my rating, I'll give it a 97% out of 100. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to join me for my next blog. In the meantime, I must make a very important but serious phone call to someone. Until then, Mustang Power.